Kriga. I go by Vivian. Some people call me Viv, and some people call me Kinigs. Like my stage name is Kinigs. Yeah, um, but those three names: Viv, Vivian, or Kinigs. Yeah. A little bit about myself. Um, I am originally from Nairobi, Kenya. I currently am a privacy engineer at Google. Um, I'm based in Seattle, in the Seattle office. I came to the US for school, so did my undergrad and then my master's, and then started my first job, which was in DC, and then just moved to Google eight months ago. Um, and yeah, besides work, I, I really like tech. I like um, posting. I like I love the gym and I like reading. Okay. Uh, yes. Oh, I like hiking now, I guess. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We're going to go into all of those okay. um, <laughs> segment by segment. Okay. okay. So my bachelor's degree is in information science. Um, I specialize in user experience. So the track was UX. And my master's is in information science. It is called master's in professional studies in information science. And the concentration is human computer interaction. Funny thing is when I got into college, I was actually a bioengineering major. So I've not always been interested in tech. Once I got into Cornell, I, I took my first coding class, which was Python. And I think that was my first introduction to tech. I always thought I would be a doctor growing up all my life up until Cornell, which is crazy to think about. But after taking Python, ended up switching my major into information science. It's hard to describe what my Cornell experience was or was like because I think I struggled in college a lot. I don't think I know I struggled in college, but I cannot foresee myself going to another college. So that's the short answer. But my life in Cornell was first, the first few years was just me trying to figure out who I am in America, who I am without my parents, who I am without being told what to do. Because in high school and all my life has just been told, you need to sleep at 10, you need to read at this point. But I had to figure all this out. The final years just felt like I was starting to becoming myself to become myself. So it was more of, whoa, I like the classes I'm taking. I love the professors I am working with. I am meeting so many underrepresented minorities in computing who are doing great things, who are working in all these big tech companies that back then I couldn't foresee myself being part of. Cornell was like a hurricane of oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. I kind of know what I'm doing. And in the end, uh, I think I know enough what I'm doing to try and make a difference to the people like me who are probably trying to figure out what they're doing. So in the tech industry or in the tech, when you're in tech field, a huge chunk of your life is, it's hammered into you that you need to get internships. I panicked a lot in college about the internships I would get and what they say about me and how they determine who had become, especially since we do need visas after, as an international student, we need visas after. I stressed way too much about internships to a point that was not healthy. Um, and in retrospect, I should have just trusted the process. With that said, I had a couple of internships. All of them in my journey contributed to where I am now. So my first internships were in Austin. There are two, this, two startups, um, owned by women. Um, so, I think this was my turning point in my career where these two founders just believed in me so much. I don't know if it was a, this is my imposter syndrome is jumping out. I was about to say, I don't know if it's because I went to Cornell, but they just believed in my skill and my talent. And I was a UX designer, um, or stroke product designer then. Um, and it was the first time I was in the industry, like not just doing school projects, kids projects with your friends that, um, didn't have like a lot of impacts, but since to the startup, we had to do a bit of everything. So I saw things like pitching, like how they pitch, how they, how they balance even life with their kids, because they're all female founders with kids and whole families. So it was just a first glimpse of reality of what is actually on the ground. Um, and then I, after that, I interned at Salesforce. Salesforce big. Salesforce felt like, Oh my God. Um, what am I doing? And I was a UX engineer then, so not even UX designer. So it was a bit different from what I'd been learning in school. And even I was like, what does a UX engineer do, you know? So our customers were internal customers, which was weird because most of my experiences had been either customers who are end users or companies like B2B or B2C. Um, but here engineers were my customers. 
Um, my other internship was a free job, which was in Nairobi. And that again was the first time I ever worked in the continent, but Nairobi. Um, last internship was Microsoft. So for my masters, we had to do a work with a company and Microsoft was the company. Same thing, internal team. What was different was for once, the stakeholder did not care about UX, just wanted the code out. So that my experience from that was just like having to be like, Hey, UX is important. Um, I guess for all my internships, I just learned and picked up many skills such as like how to behave in corporate America, how to show up as myself, how to even have a relationship with your manager, how to know people who to advocate for you versus not. They just built up slowly and slowly to like the person I'm becoming in my role currently. Yeah. So what made me stick to UX was it just kept getting more interesting for me. So I really like to learn. Like learning is one of my core values. And as long as I'm feeling, I feel like I'm in a field and I consistently am learning something new and enjoying what I'm learning, I'll keep doing it. So that's what UX felt. The first class felt like you need to know how to do user interviews, you need to do X, Y, Z. But the classes kept evolving into what do users actually think? Um, and then how do you translate that into actually a product? And for you to know that, you have to learn about what products are in the market right now. And it's just like even now, you see, it keeps going into more and more circles and I really enjoyed those circles, um, especially since I use so many apps and being in tech. You just saw this joke about, oh, Spotify or Apple Music and have these debated conversations about which one's better. But like that actually is UX and people are thinking about that. And I really enjoyed being people who are thinking about the interaction. What a privacy engineer does is a good question. Um, a privacy engineer carries out privacy assessments in short. Um, so they ensure that the products, if you're on a product team or the features you're building are compliant with the privacy policies and also are putting the user's privacy first. Um, so a good example would be just checking, are we asking users for consent? Um, and then once you've done that and they've consented, how are we treating the data that they've given us? Are we treating it the same way as the terms that you said we treat them? Are we protecting the data? So are we encrypting it at rest and um, in transit? Uh, are we, how are we storing it? Um, are, who are we sharing it with? Have they consented the people we're sharing it with? Um, are we using it for the purpose that we said we'd use it for? So just, it's a lot of privacy compliance and what we said we'd use the data, who, um, how we'd use the data, but then also a lot of ensuring we're putting the user's privacy first. Um, because it's so it's so easy to just be like this using this data in X way that the user did not consent to will give us X amount of profit, but that's not ethical. Um, yeah, and also a lot of it is just in trying we don't get fined or like are not the next companies that have been sued um, for not complying to GDPR or the new laws that are always coming out there. I think I'm a good privacy engineer because I was a UX designer um, because I think of all the flows like I think. When I think of user flow, I think as a user opens the phone, like as they consent, as they, where is the data stored? That's, I think of the whole flow and that's because I think I was a UX designer and it helps me think of what points should we be checking for privacy. Um, so that's the only transferable skill, but carrying out privacy assessments requires you to know different things than a UX designer who's doing interviews and then um, prototyping them. So the the figuring out what skills I needed in real life was hard because in UX, it's just like, you either need to know how to do user interviews, you need to know how to prototype, you need to know X, Y, Z. But for privacy engineering, it's more subjective. Like, how do I say I'm a good privacy engineer? How do you know you're carrying out privacy assessments well? You only know this if you're understanding the policies well. But how do you know you understood the privacy policies well? It just becomes a loop of lots of subjectivity. So jumping from UX to privacy was is still a steep land, like a steep jump. Um, so going back to why I even moved is, I did privacy classes at Cornell and I was passionate about both of them. And my biggest struggle even finishing school was like, how do I match both? And this resulted in me interviewing for UX positions and then privacy positions. And then when I got my UX job, I just stopped interviewing for privacy. So I jumped into UX and at the back of my mind, I was like, I'm passionate about privacy. It wasn't a well thought out 10 year plan that at this point I'm going to switch to privacy, but 
that when I had to make the call, that call was hard to make because I really love UX and I also like privacy and love privacy. But the, what made me jump was just like, when I was in my career, would I be able to make such a big jump? Um, and then also I'd been saying that um, I love privacy, but I'd never actually done it in real life. And I didn't even know what it looks like. One thing I started doing this year was every morning when I wake up, I just wake up and read tech news. Um, and it's just usually a quick, oh, what's going on in the tech industry, which helps inform me because I really like tech and I like talking about tech and just like, what's happening? Um, and I just started sharing them on Instagram. Um, just as a, oh, I'm already reading this. Let's yeah. like, let's do it. Let's share on Instagram. Um, but it soon became a, whoa, actually people do care about this. Um, I wish I had this. I wish I had a summarized version of what's going on. Every day I wake up, I say, okay, one, two. And I'm like, okay, whew. Um, just inform other people who are curious about tech news because I think people should care about tech especially since they use tech and like tech is affecting our world so much and it's this showed up in COVID when all of us had to move to Zoom um, and then thirdly third, <laughs> um, I just really like having conversations about tech and posting on Instagram inspires me to learn inspires these conversations and I learned so much because sometimes I post something and someone's like, that is not true. Which article is this from? Um, or someone will just be like, oh, what do you think about inflation? And then I'm like, oh, what do I actually think about inflation? Or sometimes I poll, like I put polls, um, like what features people, how, what people think of features, um, uh, which just helps me think about, oh, what's the general community thinking about? What features are useful versus what's not? I still don't know how, whether I'll ever use it, but in my mind, I'm always like, what if I decide to build a feature and all these tech things have informed it? Um, yeah, that's the motivation behind posting on Instagram. Well, being black in tech is a conversation that could take a whole day. Um, I, I think it was just hard being a, a minority in most of the things that I liked and the fact that especially in some of my coding classes I struggled through some of the classes sometimes it was so easy to be like maybe I don't belong because hey you're like you're one of two people in this class who look like you who are where you're from taking this class but you're not even doing great um so do you belong here you know so I think the biggest struggle being black in tech is constantly doubting us belonging because most of the people who are in the industry are not, do not look like you. I try to overcome the struggle by surrounding myself with people who look like me. So this was apparent when I was in college and I was in underrepresented minorities in computing and I was surrounded by people who are doing great things. I was like, half the population here are TAs. Half the population here has worked at Facebook, Google. They all look like me. They all, they all have backgrounds almost similar to mine or look like me um, if they don't have backgrounds similar to mine. And that just challenged me to be like, whoa, maybe we, if we do this all together, we're going to be great and excel. So just surrounding myself with a community of people who look like me and seeing people doing so much greater than me just inspires me because... A huge part of struggling for me is not having examples of people who look like me. And once I have, I'm like, damn, look at X who's like just got promoted and is like so talented and I can do it if they can do it. It just inspires me. So one, one thing is just surrounding myself with people who look like me. Another thing has, that has been helpful is talking to the people who helped through my career about my experiences of being black, whether they're black or not. Uh, a good example is my manager. So at work, we have a black orientation program and you can opt to have your manager join the program or not. Um, but one thing I did is I opted to have my manager join the program so that, especially because I, th I was the first black person he, he managed. Um, so just being... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. so we, yeah, <laughs> taking the, taking, trying to speak about the experiences you're going through with people who do not look like you to ensure that they understand how you, 
think about things and how you make decisions um has also been helpful to an extent yeah with what we just talked about about imposter syndrome one big huge takeaway is that you belong to the spaces you're in and regardless of how you got there or what you do or whether you fuck up certain things or not you belong where you are and like you're on the right journey i think that's one of my biggest takeaways because in, most of my times I'm just really, am I making the right decision? Uh, or just second guessing myself in terms of like, do I have the right skills to be here? Or even if you're doing great at work, it's like, oh, when's the next shoe dropping? But just, it's okay. You, you belong where you are. You have the right skills. You would not be in where you are if you had not, you did not have the skills you have. That's one of the biggest takeaways for me. So building community for me, has helped me just even be a better engineer or a better UX designer because I'm able to willingly be like, okay, I need feedback here. And when people give me feedback, I know it's not it's not about me. It's like, it's about your skills. Um, so I really like that. And also in my personal life, I'm just such a, I like creating community. Um, and it just gives me joy to be like, oh my God, this is my teammates and I, out not only working together, but I know when when life stuff are actually happening, I can be like, okay, yeah, I cannot show up at work because of X, Y, Z. Um, most things are not about you. Um, like they're not personally targeted to you. Um, like the reels, just everything. It's just, sometimes it's just if they're happening and you happen to be where they're happening, um, and just that makes me just know that all I need to do is show up at work, do my work, and then exit i tend to care a lot about work um and i i used to feel guilty about that because i used to be like oh i need to be an all-rounded person who yeah i'm excelling at work but like i'm not i don't love it like i i just feel bad about liking work um but now i just i i know caring about work is one of the things i am passionate about um and it stems from different things like learning and value blah 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 but that's also, it's okay to just like what you do. It's okay to show up the way you want to show up. Um, yeah. You'll never always be at a hundred percent at work, um, and in your career. And once you accept that, like, I think it just makes, at least it made my life easier. Cause I used to be like, I think it's also a black people thing or just like you expect it to be a hundred percent in all the spaces you're in because technically you don't belong in the spaces. So for you to belong, you have to be there a hundred percent. But the days I show up and I'm at 10% Vivian, and that's absolutely fine. And the days I show up, I'm at 50% Vivian, and I utilize that. Um, so that has been a huge takeaway where I just know there will be cycles. And when I'm at 150, I'm at 150. And when I'm at 10, I'm like, oh, it's an off day. So I just know mm, it's time to do the things that not need my mental space, like schedule meeting, reply to emails, expense that thing I didn't expend. Um, that's also one huge takeaway. And yeah. I think those are all I could think of now. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for yeah. this. I appreciate it. Yes. That's it. That's it? That's it. Oh, yeah. shit. Are we not going to talk about my hobbies? <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about your hobbies. Okay. Yeah. Um, 